Uh, SCR 52 by Senator Clater, um, who has given permission uh, to Representative Garofalo to handle his bill. Representative Garofalo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members. We bring you SCR 52 this morning, which is the Convention of States resolution. Um, this committee has heard this resolution twice before. We were successful last year in getting it off the floor of the House, um, but we were stopped in the Senate. This year we started in the Senate, and it's come back to the House, and we're hoping that we have the same success that we had last year. Uh, with me at the table, I have, uh, of course, Senator Cortez, who is helping Senator Clater in the Senate, and I have Professor Michael Farris. Professor Farris is the leader of the Convention of States movement nationwide. He's the, um, are you still president of Patrick Henry? He's Chancellor. Chancellor. Chancellor and founder of Patrick Henry College. He's a constitutional scholar, argued before the Supreme Court on many occasions, and is the leader of this movement. Um, basically, what this is going to do is it's going to allow Louisiana to join 33 other states in calling a convention of states to propose amendments to the Constitution. Um, our primary goal is to reduce the size of, and scope of the federal government, to impose a balanced budget amendment, and to consider term limits for federally elected representatives. Um, we hope that we're successful in this. We hope that you'll see the merits of this. We believe that it's the only way that we can rein in um, the, the runaway spending that we see in D.C. right now. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll be glad to take questions. Would you like to say anything, um, if you, Mr. Chairman doesn't mind? Uh, Senator Cortez? By all means. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee. Um, as usual, you know, the House member brings a constitutional scholar. I'm going to bring two 10th grade civic students. <laughs> so we'll have wisdom from all angles. Greater weight. Huh? Who has greater weight? The students. Well, I, think, I think you need to hear the testimony. <laughs> um, and... Uh, and I'm going to tell you, uh, when, when they get an opportunity to come to the table in a few moments, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about how they came to be at the state capitol today and a few weeks ago in the Senate committee. Um, I have a constituent in my district who uh, I ran into a friend from way back that over lunch one day, and he started talking to me about this convention of states. And I said, well, you're being a former civics teacher, um, which as they say in the Senate means I was a coach, uh, which I was, <laughs> but, but uh, having been a former civics teacher, he brought up uh, a lot of the civics lessons that I taught, and I said uh, to, to my friend, constituent Steve, you're 60-something years old. I'm going to be 55, although many people say I don't look 55, but uh, it's a good thing. Lance, it's not <laughs> 65 that you say I look. Um, I said, you know, a convention of states may take 20 years. It may take, you know, there's many uh, amendments to the Constitution that have never been ratified and it takes a long drawn out process. I said, let's go talk to the future. Let's go talk to some civics classes and if nothing else, we'll educate and we'll have an opportunity. And so we did. So we spoke to a few classes and uh, both he and I, and we challenged them and knowing that the legislative session meets during a very difficult time at the end of the school year with exams and so forth. Uh, and we challenged them and, and uh, many students wanted to be here, but we have two students that took the challenge and said, I, I agree with that and I would like to be part of the testimony. And if we could, at the end of the day, maybe when they're you know 40 or 50 years old, there's a uh, somehow or another a convention of states uh, that was called and a ratification takes place, they might be sitting in your seats or my seat uh, when it when it takes place and so the future it really belongs to to the youth and so I thought that it was a challenge that they accepted to come here and testify and so they will be at the table in a little bit to testify as to why they believe this uh, resolution has some merit so uh, with that um, uh, Mr. Chairman uh, certainly I, uh, there are other people that can speak to the the effect of the resolution and what it would do but we memorialize Congress in this body all the time and this is simply memorializing Congress uh, with this resolution so thank you for this, for the time Mr. Chairman members of the committee thank you so much uh, I, I had the privilege of hearing the young lady's Senate testimony a couple of weeks ago and there is no doubt that their testimony is more uh, effective than my own so uh, we'll just leave th that clear that up yeah you? that's right, right. <laughs> um, the, um, um, there are 20 times that the uh, legislature of Louisiana has uh, made an application under Article 5 for a convention of the states for a variety of topics. Uh, in 2014, for example, for a balanced budget amendment, they sought to repeal the 16th Amendment on income tax, other 
things over the years. Um, the, the process has three stages. When 34 states call for a convention for a particular purpose, then you have a convention uh, limited to that purpose. We've had over 400 applications in the history of our country for various kinds of topics, but we've never had a convention because there's never been two-thirds of the states to agree on a topic. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, hopefully within a few years, um, hopefully not 40 or 50, but hopefully within a few years, years, we, we believe we'll get to uh, 34 states on this particular topic, which is to impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and impose term limits on federal officials. Those three things are a rule of germaneness. That is what is permitted to be talked about at the convention, amendments relative to those topics. It, it guarantees nothing ter in terms of, of the, uh, that all those topics will be covered by, by pr proposed amendments because it requires 26 states, one state, one vote to agree on a particular balanced budget amendment, a tax limitation amendment, something about federal executive orders, something about the judiciary, and so on. And so when, um, when 26 states agree to propose something, then the third stage is 38. 38 states must ratify. And so the, the, uh, as everyone who's been around political process at all knows, it's much easier to kill legislation than it is to pass it. So the idea that something crazy could get through that process is, it requires us to take leave of our political senses. 38 states ratifying something will only be done if there's broad agreement across the uh, wide spectrum of the American public that balancing the budget, limiting taxes, limiting spending is a good idea. Um, and in the way it's done, not just the concept, but the specific way that it's done. Uh, um, there are questions raised frequently about uh, the process. I've provided, uh, I think you all got a, a five-page handout that I gave you on frequently asked questions. I'd be glad to answer any further questions, but uh, I've uh, worked uh, mainly for the homeschooling movement, uh, both in state legislatures and in uh, Washington, D.C. for over 30 years. And I'm convinced that the people's uh, freedom are, it will never be sustained as long as Washington, D.C. doesn't think that anybody can check their power. Um, if, if, and this is the check that the founders gave us. This is the, the mechanism that they said when, when the federal government abuses its authority, Article 5 is the methodology for putting structural restraints on it so that the states and the people's rights, uh, the, the state's authority and the rights of the people would be protected in this methodology. And I'd be glad to answer any questions that anybody has. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for the opportunity. You're welcome. There are no questions. Oh, excuse me. Uh, Representative Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, I'm looking at your legislation. I understand what you're trying to accomplish, but help me work my way through it. Okay. Uh, the very first part of it deals with the calling for a convention limited to certain proposals right and that seems to be a very contested issue of whether or not you can have a limited convention that when you go down the path of calling a convention then the entire constitution is in play as opposed to limited to certain purposes the uh, the reason that i believe that it's it will be limited is there's four four answers First, the historical answer. People believe falsely that uh, the original Constitutional Convention was, was uh, called for the sole purpose of, of amending the Articles of Confederation. That's not true. That's not what happened. Uh, there was an endorsement resolution by Congress, the, the Confederation Congress. People inaccurately call it the Continental Congress. It's the Confederation Congress under the Articles of Confederation. Under Article 13 of the Articles, they had no authority to call a convention for any purpose, and there's no implied authority there. Uh, and so all they did was endorse the application that had already been made by six states. Six states, starting with Virginia and New Jersey, had already called the convention, named their delegates, and gave them, given them instructions. And their instructions were to render the federal constitution adequate for the exigencies of the union. Uh, at the Virginia Ratification Convention, Patrick Henry made a... I'm sorry, you're going fast. Okay, out. <laughs> all right. You said the purpose of the call was... To, to render the federal constitution adequate for the exigencies of the union. And so if that was the call... That we, was the call. And we, before the, the convention, we had the Articles of, of Confederation. Correct. After the convention, we have our modern constitution, which we Correct. have today. 
because they and obviously it was a, a, a very big difference between the Articles of Confederation and the modern Constitution where we came in with certainly but that was consistent with the call and the question is would they obey the call if if we had a call today to amend you know everything in the Constitution you you could go more broadly than, than the specific call that we, we've made. But it, it, it's dependent upon the call. And so the call that you propose is right. limited to the very first one, to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. Correct. That's the entire United States Constitution. No, no it's not. Is it not? Okay. No, well, I mean, the, the, well, for, well, let me ask you, it, would, it, would it involve Article One of the Constitution? which deals with the powers of the legislative branch. Okay. Would that be germane to, the, to limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government? The, there are items within Article I that could be changed. The changing entirely of Article I, for example, the, Article I tells you the selection of the method of Congress. That's not up for grabs because that's not the power and jurisdiction of Congress. That is the method of selection of Congress. Those are different things. So not all of Article I is up for grabs, but... But certainly when you get to Article I, Section 8, where you're dealing with the Commerce Clause... The Commerce Clause... you're dealing with the, the, the right of Congress to borrow money on the credit of the United States, and you go through all of the enumerations under Section 8 of Article I, all of those matters would be essentially germane to the subject matter of the, the powers and jurisdictions of the federal government, right? Changing the Commerce Clause, which was intended to give the federal government the power, ability to regulate interstate shipping uh, rather, rather than regulating the wages and hours of babysitters, um, that is germane. The General Welfare Clause was not intended to give Congress the unlimited authority to spend money on any fool thing they wanted. Uh, changing the, gen the meaning of the General Welfare Clause back to its original meaning, which the, the germaneness, Alexander Hamilton, uh, view of the General Welfare Clause was it is an additional grant of power, but it is limited by the principle that the states have jurisdictional competence over the topic. The federal government acquires no such competence under the General Welfare Clause. So fixing particular items within Article I, Section 8, yes, indeed, would be germane. So, so right, it would be germane. Can, can, I, can I respond to it? Can Absolutely, I respond to your question? Senator. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I think we're getting in the weeds here. Well, we, and, and, I think it's and, important, and, too, I, get I, in the weeds. Yeah, I, and here's, here's the reality, okay? This resolution says go, if 33 of 34 of you agree, go talk about it. That's what it says. We're not talking about the Commerce Clause here. We're not talking about any of that other stuff. The fact that it would be germane to it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grant you it may well be germane. But do you think 38 states post conversation, we can't have a, a resolution in this body without having 50 lobbyists talk to us about it? Do you not think that if they call a convention of the states, by, just for everybody's you know, knowledge, it's never been done. So you don't think there would be people, special interest groups all over that thing, representing not only special interests, but us. The legislature would determine who the delegates were. So we, us, would determine who would go there, and we would send them there with directives. And, and I guess part of my concern... But if we're fearful, uh, I'm sorry, but if we're fearful of even talking about it, man, we, we got a bigger problem than, than the, what the words on this paper say. Well, I think, well, a couple of things. I certainly appreciate the effort. I do. I think the words on the paper do matter to have an understanding of, of what we're trying to accomplish. And my concern is always with those people who don't have representation in that room. I mean, there are certain things that we like about the United States Constitution, and I'm not certain that, one, you can limit it to a limited call, and two, if the limited call is the powers and jurisdictions of the federal government, well, the United States Constitution is what defines the powers and jurisdiction of the federal government as putting the entire Constitution into play. Yeah, and so I, I believe that Article right. 1... But, 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 but I, I don't disagree with you. But let me state this. What would have to happen is an amendment would have to come from that, those delegates. And then ratification would have to take place by 38 states. That means 13 states could just say, we disagree. So we could be, we could very easily be, just by example, we could have delegates.
Delegates go there, propose from Louisiana, propose an amendment. It come out of that convention and the le legislature of Louisiana not ratified. Just that simple. And, and the, the amount of time that could take, take place between that and then could be multiple legislatures. Because, because we still have amendments that have not been ratified by the state of Louisiana that are sitting on the books. We have some that we didn't ratify, then we came back and ratified. And as you know, with term limits here in Louisiana and in many other states, we're going to get a complete turnover over and over. But I want to, and I don't want to not respond to your question appropriately, but I think that if you, if you want to talk about the possibility of the call, then to me, it's, it's certainly relevant to the, to the conversation, but I think it's so, so far down the list of things we're talking about. The question is, does Louisiana want to participate with the other 33 states that it would require for them to call a convention? And that's really the question. And if we don't want to participate, to talk about any possibility of any change to the Constitution, then a no vote on this resolution would be appropriate. If we want to talk about it, if we're concerned that, we, you know, that there may be one little thing that someone, maybe Delaware, would bring up that would be relevant, and we want to talk about it, then we have to impose this, this uh, because the, the, the last, um, um, the, the, well, there's never been a, uh, an amendment drafted out of a convention of states, as far as I know. And it's always been drafted by the, by the Congress. If I, if I could just briefly um, f finish a part of my answer, and that is this legislature has called for a convention of the states 20 times. It's never run away. It never, it, nothing's ever bad happened from that. And if, if there was no limitation on the subject matter, if the subject matter didn't matter and the whole Constitution's opened up, it doesn't matter what you call it. If it's a balanced budget amendment, it's the right to life, if it's 16th Amendment, anything, theoretically, if, that, if your theory is true, opens it up. This legislature has 20 times said, eh, we don't buy the theory that it will open up. And 400 times, in American history, state legislatures have said, eh, we don't, we don't agree with that. And John Marshall at the Virginia Ratification Convention, when this argument was made, said, gentlemen have proven that the delegates did not disobey their instructions. So the idea that delegates would disobey their instruction is not, a, is not valid as a matter of law, it's not valid as a matter of history, and requires speculation about politics that just requires us to take leave of common sense. Uh, and I don't think that we would take leave of common sense. But my question, though, is, 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 is related to this. You're talking about whether or not the, the delegates, the ambassadors, will follow the instructions of the call. And, and I guess my point is, I can't find an article of the Constitution, not even talking about the amendments, an article of the Constitution that wouldn't come into play if the call is limited to the scope powers and jurisdiction of the federal government. I mean, I can look at Article 2. Um, I can look at Article 4. I can look at Article 5. And I, I just don't see where, how any of these amendments would not be germane to the subject matter of the power and jurisdiction of the federal government. So it would not be limited in any scope at all. So it's not as if the delegates could disobey. It's the delegates are instructed to go deal with the powers and jurisdiction of the federal government, and that's the entire Constitution. It, it's not the entire Constitution. Article 1, Section 8 is not the same as Article 1, Section 9, Artic nor Article 1, Section 10, nor Article 2, Section 1, Article 2. You know, the fact that you can, there's a lot of different provisions within each article. The fact that you might be able to touch one thing in one article, one thing in another article, another thing in another article, so doesn't article mean that the. Article 1, Section 9 deals with you know, the Constitution, the, the constituting of tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court. Well, that certainly deals with the scope and powers of, of the, the federal. I, I, I think you're enumerating the various things that are theoretically possible, takes us into the area where political speculation replaces political common sense. And, and I think that political common sense has to prevail. The founders gave us this method for a reason. They wanted the states to decide how, how much power the federal government should have. And if, if fear is going to be the reason that we, we don't stop the federal government from abusing its power, all we're going to get is 
more abuse of power. So, I mean, you can fear monger all you want, but I fear monger. Well, you know. I'm certainly just if, asking if it's question. opening up the entire Constitution, that's a fear to me that it would fear make me afraid. I don't want to open up the entire Constitution. So that's what I mean by that. I don't want to. I don't know anybody that wants to open up the entire Constitution, no matter where they come down on anything. So you have a convention with with people of all political persuasions who don't want to open up the entire Constitution. And we're asked to speculate that that would happen. I, I just don't think it's realistic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Ivey. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you, you mentioned the practical nature of this process, and, and that's, and, and that's kind of where I want to hone in on. Uh, where do the delegates? get their instructions from obviously there needs to be a pro does this resolution I don't see anything about delegate selection or instruction specifically to de delegates could you walk me through that process sure we, we would have to pass a separate piece of legislation that would determine the delegate selection process and what the delegates were authorized to deal with at, at the convention okay and so we can get as wordy as we want with regard to we can take every single article what is off limits or what it, you know and the specific goal and or endeavor uh it's the will totally, of the legislature it, let's say for a balanced budget amendment we're looking for this you know similar language to this for a balanced budget amendment uh to accomplish it, it's these totally things. within the purview of the louisiana legislature to determine how its amendment uh, how its ambassadors would be what, what charge they would have at the convention and because so let's say we had a convention okay that a convention was called uh and let's say Louisiana, uh, we could not agree on the delegate selection process or the instructions to those de delegates. Would we be able to participate in that convention? We would still we would have a seat at the table, but we would have to have a set of instructions. For right, but delegate. let's say that we failed to do that because of the complication, because maybe we couldn't come to some understanding. Let's just, it, would we not have a, an official recognizable position uh, at the convention if you have to appoint delegates you, you have to you have to appoint delegates if you don't appoint delegates Louisiana just would not participate right so and so my point is I, I believe that the process is such that w Louisiana can give those instructions to the delegates and, and knowing how Louisiana works through uh, complicated issues things that are important to everybody uh, it, it's going to have to have some type of uh, bipartisan support politics uh, and also a fair representation uh, for all of Louisiana exactly and and the instructions as I said would have to be very specific absolutely so I, I believe that could easily remedy that co the concept of you know a bunch of people are going to go there and they're going to uh, you know start talking about things no, well, that they should as I said before representative Ivy we have three checks number one we believe the call limits the scope of the, of the convention number two our legislation appointing our ambassadors would be able we would be able to limit what the ambassadors could vote on we would be able to determine when they would be recalled we would have basically total control over what they do mm -hmm. and thirdly as, as represent, uh, Senator Cortez mentioned we still have to pass that hurdle of three quarters of the states ratifying so 13 states states could get together and say no we don't like this amendment and it doesn't go on the Constitution so it's a, it's a very high hurdle there are a lot of protections absolutely uh, is it possible to draft language in a, a, a resolution for the delegates to say uh, that the legislature could you know uh, remove you as a delegate absolutely. if you uh, veer outside of the boundaries. Absolutely. Okay, and some so. states are even c c considering um, making a, making it a felony if they veer outside. There are questions about whether that can can be done if they're outside of the state, but that's what some states are talking about right now. Okay. Well, so uh, a lot of safeguards uh, that are uh, we are able to put in uh, that Absolutely. that next step. Practically, how many delegates could be at a convention? You, I, I think most states are yes, choosing like five or six. Is that correct? Practically, yeah. yeah. Pra pragmatically, we, I think it'll be five, seven, five or seven. I think they'll send an odd number. At least several hundred people at this convention. Sure, it, it, it'll be about the size of a little bit smaller than the U.S. House of Representatives. Okay. Uh, 
and we only have 105 members in, in our body and I tell you it's it's very difficult to agree on controversial stuff it's extremely difficult uh, even within in the same party uh, we have uh, tremendous disagreements on uh, ways to solve problems so I believe the, there's strength in numbers in that uh, that the numbers themselves offer an additional protection uh, it's not just uh, one person from each state getting together it's 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 a much larger group that's all, that's all, right, Rep. Ivan? Yeah, that's all. <laughs> I smell what you're stepping in. Thank, thank you, Representative Ivan. <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> thank you, Representative Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's a question I, I have dealing with the process in terms of how, how we are approaching the problem to limit the power of the federal government, which I, which I agree is has overstepped and I've supported this every time it's come before this committee. Uh, you know, one of the proposals uh, is to limit the terms of office that may be served by officials and members of Congress. I know I'm probably in the 1% that don't believe in term limits. Well, believe but, me, we have several people in this room who don't uh, believe in term limits. You know, uh, and, and I believe that term limits are, n are not a substitute for having an active, engaged, and informed electorate supporting qualified candidates and actually getting out to vote in those elections. I mean, I feel like we have term limits as an autopilot. Think we, oh, if we can just have term limits, we'll finally get Congress to do the right thing. And I disagree with that. Sure. And, and uh, Professor Ferris will be able to expound on what other states sure. are doing with that and where he believes we're going with it. But the way the call is worded right now, we could consider term limits for both federally elected representatives and for federal judges and federal officials. And I think that some of that should be on the table. And if you would, Professor, tell us what well, other states well, are. The, the, first, the first thing, the, what I would want to ask is this. Why wouldn't we just consider what breaking this up and, and going through what has been a traditional way of uh, changing and uh, amending the Constitution and having all the states bring us a, a proposed constitutional amendment to say term limits on federal elected officials and uh, so forth as opposed to being, you know, and we could, why not piecemeal that as opposed to taking this? Uh, tell me the Can strengths. I uh, versus sure, go, can, uh, can I respond? Because yeah, sure. I'm going to have to leave. I've got okay. going to chair a committee in, in a few minutes. A um, couple things. Uh, again, I, I want to make sure that everybody understands that Senator Clater and I agreed to bring this legislation. I'm here on his behalf. And certainly that has been done. I think it was spoken to. They have the balanced budget amendment that's out there. They have a number of different ones out there. This particular document that we're talking about is what we decided to bring based on you know the, the conversation with the convention of states and there there are I don't know maybe nine or ten different organizations that are attempting to do something similar with a little different twist sort of what you're talking about but we can all disagree on the minutia of what's going to be discussed but we can't discuss it until you get 34 states to pass a resolution that's identical. So the, 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 I'm, and I'm kind of going around the question. The question is, could you change this one? Sure, you could change it and you, you could take out uh, term limits, you could take out this, but then you wouldn't be aggregating in, right. in, in line with the other states. Well, and I'm not saying change this one. I mean, I, look, I, I, I know I vote on legislation that I'm not ever 100% satisfied with, you know, and I, I'm, I'm in support of the, of the legislation and support of the concept. My, my question would be, you know, why not attack it at more of a piecemeal, whereas I think you might, why, why couldn't we go you at may it get that, that way? I, I guess and, and, my point would be you may get that because we've I think we've had a balanced budget amendment. It's uh, passed two years. Well, I'm talking about the, a term limit amendment. I think seems right, like that right now, I, you know, the term limit amendment probably would pass overwhelmingly well, by almost every state immediately. The the beauty part of this resolution is that we can consider all of those issues, mm -hmm. and all of the other groups around the country who are trying to get their proposals passed, their, their resolutions passed. 
this resolution would allow us to consider all of those proposals. So it, it's basically anything that, as we've talked about, would reduce the size and scope of the federal government. But also, I want to add this, Representative Miller, that we can easily, in the legislation that we pass, as appointing our ambassadors, we could easily tell them that we don't want them to consider term limits for elected, federally elected representatives. And, and so I'm, I'm supposing that, that you want to restrict the, the term limits. I mean, because I, I wouldn't want to have a situation where they say, well, we have term limits for the president, but we want different term limits for the president, which could mean that instead of we go back to the uh, under Franklin Roosevelt and have four terms. I mean, not. Oh, oh, that would expanding. be a, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's restrict all of these. Um, but my my contention would be that we don't know. That's all supposition because Utah might get there and say something different than Delaware. So it's it's like a call for a special session. You get there and you deal with what's within the call, and and you can, as you well know. You can have someone from a per certain area of the state be totally for something and someone from another part of the state be totally against it, and there is no, no resolution in, in sight. The flip side is there may be some come together on a third issue, and yeah. that would, could yeah. come out. And that to me seems like where if, if, you know, I know there's probably consensus on this issue, uh, whereas there's not consensus on the other issues that you and I, we all agree on right. certain things. There's some things that there's broad consensus on, and but anyway, I, I'm in support of your bill, and I you. uh, appreciate you bringing it. Thank y'all for being here. Thank you, Representative Miller. Representative Jenkins. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm gonna go back uh, to some of the conversation that was going on with Representative Carter, and I think the term fear mongering was used, and um, I, I'm simply saying this. Uh, as it relates to this, uh, you know, our present Constitution has been interpreted by the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, in a fashion where some people think there has been some net, net gains, everything from campaign financing uh, to health care to marriage. Uh, isn't it true that, you know, if an amendment uh, is made to the Constitution, I'm not saying that. That's what the purpose of this is, but isn't it true that if an amendment is made to the Constitution addressing some of those areas, you're basically legislatively overruling what the Supreme Court said about some of those subject matters. I'm not necessarily saying that your scope is to do that or there's some motive to do it. I'm just saying, generally speaking, you can legislatively overrule a Supreme Court interpretation of our present Constitution. Exactly right. Just like the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment reverse Dred Scott. That's exactly right. Correct, correct. And, and so, so that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I don't think it's fear mongering when you have people who feel like there has been some gains <laughs> over a long period of time with the Constitution that we have, uh, and a court, uh, <coughs> and a highest court in the land has taken a look at it and has made some interpretations of that Constitution. And I, I, I'm simply saying that to say, you know, that there it's not fear mongering to, to look at and see whether or not net gains that have been made now uh, could be legislatively overruled uh, by amendments that come out of a constitutional convention. Representative Jenkins, uh, if, if I'm allowed to make sure that we include political realism, mm -hmm. anything that the American public broadly believes is a net gain from constitutional interpretation, will, there is no way in this world that it would be reversed by an amendment. It's only things where the vast majority of the American public thinks that is not a net gain, and that is just the gradual but steady increase of federal power over all of our lives, where we're losing more and more of our ability to make our own decisions at, at the state level, more and more uh, loss of ability to make our own personal decisions. Those are the kinds of things where the vast majority of the American public thinks we need to make some corrections. When I was talking about was fear-mongering is a theory that the entire Constitution would be thrown out and rewritten. That, I think, is an improper fear, and it's not going to happen. There's no realistic way that that could ever happen in our country, and I don't think there's any chance that we're going to throw out 
the 13th or 14th or 15th amendments in the in the gains that they made we we paid a great price to reverse the supreme court's decision in dread, dread scott but it was the right thing to do and we made the right decision on that and so just because it's you know there there's some decisions of the supreme court that are great others not so great i helped reverse the supreme court decision called uh, in employment division versus smith when they threw religious freedom into the tank and I'm, I'm the guy who named the Religious Freedom Restoration Act that passed uh, unanimously in the House of Representatives and 97 to 3 in the U.S. Senate. And so sometimes the Supreme Court gets some things wrong, so we need to reverse them legislatively. But only those things where the vast majority of the American public thinks we need to make this correction. That's the only thing that's possible here. The question is, should any corrections be made to the federal government's power? I think the vast majority of Americans and the vast majority of this legislature think we should make some corrections to federal power. Sure. Again, even assuming that the, the convention goes beyond the scope, the call, the scope of the call, even assuming that they go beyond the scope of our legislative mandate to them when we appoint them, we still have the ratification process. And exactly what Professor Farris is saying is true that it's going to be really, really hard to get three quarters of the states, 38 states, to agree on something that the vast majority of the American people don't want. It, it would be impossible. So with those three checks, Representative Jenkins, I believe that it's almost an impossibility that we have any of those social issues or any of those issues where we're concerned that that's the set, it should be set where it is. I, I'm, I'm very convinced that that won't happen. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your answers. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, the board is clear. We do have some other folks want to speak uh, in support of Madeline Matuk. It's our young Anna Gray Shuffler. Please excuse me if I mispronounce your name. No, you got it right. <laughs> okay. Go right ahead. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Madeline Matuk, and I'm a sophomore at St. Thomas More High School in Lafayette. I'm here today to speak in favor of Senate Concurrent Resolution 52. In the last 20 years, our country has grown its debt from eight to $18 trillion. This begs the question, how does the world's only superpower with all of its resources incur such a huge debt? I think that the answer is best explained by looking at the enormous growth of our federal government. Our founding fathers, who risked life and limb to establish the country as an independent and free nation, surely did not envision the situation in which we find ourselves today. In fact, I believe our founding fathers went to great pains to ensure that this situation would never occur. The Constitution of the United States, written by those same founding fathers, creates a nation consisting of individual, independent, and sovereign states with the ability to govern themselves largely, independent of a central federal government. In fact, the Constitution limits the powers of the federal government. Over the last 40 to 50 years, the federal government has expanded its authority and its will upon the entire nation, seeking to create one unified state as opposed to 50 independent states, as contemplated by the original Constitution. This expansion of our federal government requires not only an increase in income, which is done through heavy taxation, but also through the excess printings of our nation's currency, resulting in devaluing our dollar. When this nation was born, it consisted of independent and individual states, formed for the purpose of freedom from the tyranny of an impressive central government. The Congress has whittled away our state sovereignty, and therefore, we, the next generation, must seek to restore the original intent of our Founding Fathers. This can only be done by our return to the principles and the purpose of the original Constitution, that is limited federal involvement and greater individual state sovereignty. Some examples of the overreaching of our federal government would include limitations on the amount of water we can use for our showers. The federal government has placed restrictions on the volume of water that can come out of a shower head in order to regulate water usage. Louisiana, unlike California, does not have a problem with the amount of water available for use. In fact, our water tables are so high, it sometimes presents a problem. 
Another example would be regulating the temperature on our dishwashers and washing machines so as to prevent excess usage of energy. As we so well know, there is no problem with available energy resources here in Louisiana. Therefore, applying these regulations in Louisiana makes little or no sense. I can go on naming many more silly examples of federal interference in our daily lives, but you can clearly see my point. Therefore, I ask you support Senate Concurrent Resolution 52, seeking to, re to return Congress to its original purpose, limiting its authority and its reach, and restoring the sovereignty of the individual states. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairperson, committee members, let me start by saying it is such an honor to be with you all today. My name is Anna Grace Scheffler, and I'm a sophomore at St. Thomas More Catholic High School in Lafayette. I'm very proud to be an American and to be born and raised right here in Louisiana. When Senator Cortez came to talk to my civics class concerning a convention of the states, what they were saying really resonated with me. Our country has strayed away from what our founding fathers intended this nation to be. They intended this, for this country to have a small and centralized federal government. They intended for the states to have power, and they intended for all citizens to have a voice. As of now, this is not how our government is. Our federal government has become so powerful that the states cannot exercise their basic powers that have been rightfully given to them. I realize that we are the generation that all of these problems, such as the $19 trillion deficit, will fall on if they are not fixed soon. It is time for the states to take a stand in order to save the future of our great nation, and I strongly believe that a convention of the states is the answer. It is time for citizens to take a stand, and it is time for America to get back to its roots. Thank you all so much for your time today, and I encourage you to vote in favor of Senate Concurrent Resolution 52. Thank you. Thank you all both for your testimony. Thank much you. Much appreciated. Thank you. We do have some other speakers. In, in support, wishing to speak, Representative Johnson and... In support, wishing to speak, Del Clary with the Convention of States. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be very brief. Um, I know all of you well. You know me, and you know my background's constitutional law. I'm going to concede to you that I was one who was slow to come to this conclusion to support the idea of the Convention of States because I, too, my initial reaction was, what about the runaway convention and some of the questions that have been asked? But I've been reading and studying on this for the last year or so, um, actually longer than that, uh, and, and I have come to conclusion that th this is me personally, just for what it's worth to you as my colleagues. I do believe now that this is the only measure that we have to limit the expansive growth and increasing uh, encroachment of the federal government, it, it, particularly the exa executive branch. No matter who is the next president, we're now on this course, this precedent where um, the executive powers have been expanded so broadly and the Congress is no longer doing its job to be the firewall of protection against that. Our system of checks and balances is breaking down. And we once might have said, well, we can rely on the federal courts to limit that. But increasingly, the federal courts have become very political. I'm telling you that from firsthand experience because I've been out there for 20 years litigating these cases, First and Second Amendment cases in the courts. And uh, oftentimes they are making law from the bench rather than calling it fairly and squarely as an umpire. So um, Justice Scalia was one of the people that I, I greatly respected as an intellect on the court, as a constitutional scholar. I was in a small group gathering with him about two years before he passed. We were in Washington. It was a group of about 30 constitutional law litigators and scholars. And we had a rare about an hour with him to just Q&A very informal. And someone asked the, the early question in this dialogue, they, they raised their hand and they said, Justice Scalia, what about states' rights? What about the Tenth Amendment? And he balked and, and uh, sort of um, came, came down really hard on the person who asked the question and he said, what a joke. States' rights is over. You know, and I'm like, wow, this is Justice Scalia. Like, you're my hero. You're supposed to be standing for states' rights. And he went on to explain his view that, that you know, many of these constitutional principles, the bedrock fundamental principles of the republic, have, have uh, gone by the wayside. And he was a proponent of a limited convention, not an open convention, but a limited convention on a limited call like this, because he believed himself that it was the only way that we could check this uh, this expansive federal power where they've usurped 
the authority that is supposed to be given to the people. So for what it's worth, and I, I don't want to have some long you know, debate. I know you guys are going to be here a long time. Um, I, I'm open to talk with you about it individually any time that you wish. But I really believe, I've come to the conclusion that this is the right thing to do. It's the only thing that we can do right now, I think, uh, to fix this problem. So uh, I just wanted to weigh in on that and uh, appreciate the time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Larry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dale Clary. I'm a volunteer for the Convention of States. I'm born and raised here in Baton Rouge, practice law here in the state of Louisiana all my career. Uh, I am a volunteer here just to, to say, number one, I, I can't follow the ladies, the girls. They did a great job. We believe fully in what they said. I'm here, though, to present to you almost 5,000 petitions. It's in, in the boxes in the corner over there, signed by Louisiana citizens in support of the Convention of States resolution. Uh, we have all, over 500 of them just from the districts of the members of the committee here. Uh, we're here to tell you one thing. We trust you more than we trust Washington, D.C. Republican, Democrat, Independent, we trust you more than we trust those folks that are up there in Washington. We see what they're doing. They can't control themselves. They can't control their spending. They can't control their debt. We know that if we contact you by email or, or phone, we're going to get a response. So what I'm telling you is we believe in you folks more than we believe in Washington, D.C., and this is the technique, this is the tool that we have to rein in a runaway Washington, D.C. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the board's clear. I do have some uh, cards in support. Um, Chad Durr, Convention of States, uh, not wishing, uh, will present and provide information if necessary. In support, uh, present will provide information uh, Clifford Evans, Convention of States, in support will provide information, Sutherland and Clark, citizen from Albany, Louisiana. In support will uh, provide information, Steve Gardies uh, from Lafayette. In support, um, not wishing to speak, Charles Smith. In support, um, not wishing to speak, Joe Consini of Convention of States. Sorry if I butchered that name. Uh, Michael, excuse me, in support, not wishing to speak. Michael Hall from Lafayette, in support, not wishing to speak. Vincent Costanza uh, with AL Scrap Metals in Kenner, uh, in support, not wishing to speak. Chuck Rims from the Convention of States, in support, not wishing to speak. Cynthia Greer, Convention of States, in support, not wishing to speak. Michael T. Barrett. Uh, Convention of States in support not wishing to speak Christina Durr Convention of States in support not wishing to speak Bo Sonier from Lafayette in support not wishing to speak Carol Morgan Convention of States in support not wishing to speak Randy Daigle from Jennings in support not wishing to speak Craig Carman um, Article 5 Convention of States in support not wishing to speak Jeffrey Welsh of uh, Convention of States in support, not wishing to speak, Pamela Welsh, Convention of States in support, not wishing to speak, Stephen Sonier, um, Bass Companies in Lafayette in support, not wishing to speak, Angela Schofler um, in Lafayette in support, not wishing to speak, Martin Nolan from Baton Rouge in support, not wishing to speak, Laura Smith uh, from Denham Springs not wishing to speak, uh, Bruce Smith, Convention of States. We do have a card in opposition. Uh, well, first, let me read this white card. We have a card. We'll provide information um, and would like to speak. Uh, Professor Diamond with um, LSU Law. Is he here? Would you like to speak? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I took the liberty, Mr. Chairman, of uh, making copies of the United States Constitution, highlighting each of the sections that I thought were clearly, thank you, uh, were, would clearly be the subject of the call 
of, um, of the resolution, even in its most narrow form. Uh, my name is Raymond Diamond. I'm a professor at LSU Law Center. Uh, I'm a legal historian. I've taught constitutional law for over 30 years. And I have written, among other subjects, on the structure of government, federal government, the framing of the United States Constitution, and the debates among the states in conventions to ratify the Constitution. Um, and I'm here to speak about SCR 52. It goes without saying, but I do wish to say it for the sake of redundancy and emphasis that I am speaking for myself, uh, the opinions that I offer, the perceptions that I share, and the conclusions I make are those of uh, myself and not LSU. Uh, the Constitution has been amended 27 times as, has, as is possible under Article 5 of the Constitution. Each of these amendments was proposed by two-thirds of each House of Congress and in turn ratified by three-quarters of the legislatures of the states. The nation has never taken advantage of an alternative provided by Article 5, that of the application of two-thirds of the states, that's 34 of 50, that upon that application Congress might call a constitutional convention to propose amendments, which in turn would require ratification by the legislatures of the states. Understand what SCR 52 is. SCR 52 would have Louisiana squarely in the midst of a national effort to call for a constitutional convention for its stated purposes. This is said to be a straightforward matter. It is not. Now first, uh, let us define terms. Uh, the convention that would be called under Article 5 is not a convention of states. It may seem like a small thing, but it is important. Article 5 speaks explicitly to a convention to be called for proposing amendments. This is not a convention of states. Congress will call the convention. Conceivably, Congress will appoint the delegates. The delegates are not necessarily or at all going to be ambassadors of the states. Congress might call a thousand people as delegates of this convention. We don't know. The formation of the convention is an obligation of Congress, but the formation of the uh, convention within that obligation is a subject of Congress's discretion. Now, Let's understand what the implications are of this not being a convention of the states. The states do not control the delegates to the convention, not unless Congress says so. Uh, the states really do not control the call of the convention. Uh, if you think about it, if this convention were limited to the specific proposals that the states would put forward, you would have 34 states, a minimum of 34 states, controlling uh, the decisions that the representatives of 50 states, the entire nation, would undertake in the convention. If this were true, uh, we would be converting this constitutional convention, an independent constitutional body, we would be converting this constitutional convention into the errand boy of the 34 states which had passed this particular resolution. It strikes me that the states cannot control uh, this uh, constitutional convention. It cannot control the delegates to this constitutional convention. I have read as well of states which have considered all manner of controls that might be put on the delegates, including uh, criminal penalties for violating uh, their instructions. Uh, unfortunately, this is actually a rather laughable concept. States cannot control federal actors. States can't control their senators, they can't control their representatives, they can't even control the members of the electoral college 
who cast votes on behalf of their states. We have from time to time instances of the faithless elector who does his or her own thing in the electoral college and fails to vote for the person um, uh, whom, um, whom the elector was designated to vote, vote for. This happens and there's nothing that a state can do about it. Now I would point out something else, and this is in, con in, in support of the notion that a convention is not necessarily at all limited to the call of the convention. If you consider the resolution of February 21, 1787, when the Continental Congress called for a convention to revise the Articles of Confederation, um, we came out with a replacement for the Articles of Confederation. Uh, the convention in the resolution of February 21, 1787, if you, if you were to look at the journals of, uh, the, of, um, of the Continental Congress, what you would see is that the Continental Congress specifically um, put off, tabled, uh, any converse, uh, a vote rather on the Annapolis Convention of 1786 which called for changes in the Articles of Confederation. Instead, at the instance of the delegates from New York, a different resolution was called for. Uh, this different resolution spoke to the mechanisms in the Articles of Confederation for amending the Articles of Confederation and that is the amendment which passed. That, sorry, excuse me. That is the uh, provision which passed. Please note that the the Constitution, uh, which was uh, proposed by the Philadelphia Convention, uh, has a method of adoption uh, which is far outside of the limitations of the Articles of Confederation. Um, the thought that what the Philadelphia Convention was was a runaway convention, um, that's not necessarily um, language that I would use, but it's very clear that the Philadelphia Convention uh, did its own thing, and I think that we should consider, as we think about this, um, this constitutional convention that is being proposed, we should consider that we are at risk for, of the same thing happening. So that's point number one. This is not a convention of states. Point number two uh, is that there is no certainty of control. There is no certainty of control uh, with respect to the activities of the convention. So. Now, let us consider, however, what if the proponents are right that this convention is limited to uh, the subjects of uh, imposing fiscal restraints on the federal government and limiting the power and jurisdiction of the federal government and imposing turn limits? Um, Arguably, term limits and fiscal restraints are relatively self-defining phrases. And I would point out, however, that our federal judiciary serve for a term of good behavior. And as Thurgood Marshall once said, and as Antonin Scalia recently demonstrated, that means that the appointment is potentially for life. This unlimited term was advised by the framers of the Constitution to guarantee an independent federal judiciary. One could argue against an unlimited term for, fe for the federal judiciary, but one would have to understand that imposing term limits goes against the policies adopted by the framers of the Constitution. Fiscal restraints, once again, perhaps self-defining, but fiscal restraints go to the question of monetary restraints as well. And I would point out as well that for a state like Louisiana, uh, which receives much more from the federal government 
uh, in monies appropriated to be spent here in the state of Louisiana and by the state of Louisiana. For a state like Louisiana, the imposition of fiscal restraints on the federal government quite possibly goes against the state's interest. If you consider how much of the budget of the state of Louisiana is not money generated in Louisiana, but instead which is money appropriated by the federal government to be spent by the state government, one wonders whether it is in the state of Louisiana's interest that we have uh, stringent fiscal restraints. Now, all of this is opened up by SCR 52. Now, limiting the power and jurisdiction of the federal government is not self-defining. Uh, between the two political branches of the federal government, that's the President and the Congress, the power of the federal government goes to, among other things, the f conduct of foreign policy, providing for and the control of the military, making war, the use of the militia to enforce laws and to respond to insurrection and invasion, collecting taxes, borrowing money, appropriating money to be spent, and importantly, control, control of interstate and foreign commerce. Um, I would point out, for example, that the 1964 Civil Rights Act was not a function of Congress's power to uh, enforce uh, the Equal Protection Clause under the 14th Amendment. The 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, the Open Housing Act, um, th these were passed under Congress's power to control interstate commerce. Beyond this, Congress has power to enforce the terms of the 13th Amendment's ban on slavery and involuntary servitude. On the 14th Amendment's command that no state shall deny equal protection of the laws or due process of law to any person. The 15th, 19th, and 24th Amendment's guarantee of the right to vote with irrespective of race or gender or payment of poll taxes. All of this and more is the subject of SCR 52. Now our brief statement of history is in order. SCR 52 runs counter to the judgment of the framing generation that had had the experience of dealing with a weak federal government under the Articles of Confederation. The Union of States was beset under the Articles with the experience of states that discriminated against out-of-state actors. Congress could not provide tax revenue to fund the federal government's operations, could not control the money supply or the printing of money by the several states, could not adequately respond to Shays' Rebellion. It is true that the government of the United States under the Constitution is intended to be inefficient, and it is with its division of power among three branches of government, and one of those being split into two parts, with its further division of power between the federal government and the state governments. And, and, and again, this is inherently inefficient. We, we have seen inefficiency in federal government over time, and we see it today, given the existence of periodic stalemate and government by crisis readily apparent in Washington. But the Constitution was confected to delegate more power to the federal government so that government might be effective if the will were found among the political branches of government to use it. And this is a point which lies across the width and breadth of the conversations at the Federal Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia and the state ratifying conventions. It is confirmed not only uh, by Federalists, it is also confirmed by confirmed anti-Federalists like Patrick Henry, uh, who was uh, a determined opponent of um, the, the Constitution primarily because uh, of the extent of power that he thought it gave to the federal government. So 
I would suggest that the most restrictive reading of SCR 52, under this most restrictive reading, the one that's offered by its proponents, a constitutional convention would have open to it an extraordinary scope, the limitation of any and all of these executive and legislative powers. Beyond this, however, is that Article Three of the Constitution provides that it is in the federal judiciary that the federal judicial power lies. That is the power, according to Madison ver Mar Marbury versus Madison, 18, uh, 1803, as Marbury put it, that is the power to say what the law is and to speak with finality as to the meaning of federal constitutional and statutory law. So a constitutional convention with the call to consider amendments to limit the power of the federal government is one which has the call to limit the power and the jurisdiction of the federal judiciary as well. Uh, so what does this mean? That this convention might well consider taking jurisdiction away from the federal judiciary with respect to, oh, let's say the First Amendment. Um, or the right to an abortion, or the Second Amendment. It can limit the subject matter that federal courts are able to hear, that that is part of the subject of the call of this convention, even at its most narrow formulation. A convention with the call all to consider limitations on the power and jurisdiction of the federal courts then uh, is one which explicitly calls for consideration of limitations on the subject matter of the federal courts, such that we might be left with what NYU's professor Bert Newborn called, and I love this term, a cacophonous constitution, one whose meaning is not pronounced with finality by the Supreme Court, but instead is spoken variously and differently by state courts throughout the land, such that the First Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment, for example, might have a different meaning potentially in each one of the states. There would be no single meaning. Uh, the consideration of SCR 52 is an exercise in constitutional politics. Um, and I think constitutional politics is a good thing, if I'm permitted to say that. Abraham Lincoln engaged in it. Uh, women are guaranteed the right to vote. The nation ended slavery. 18-year-olds have the right to vote because of constitutional politics. But we should be aware of the implications of that which we propose with respect to the Constitution. The limited call and I use this expression in quotes, is not limited at all, even under the most restrictive reading that its proponents claim. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your time. I'm open to questions thank if there you are for, any. Professor Diamond, we do have a question. Representative Ivey. Oh, man. I, tell you, I feel <laughs> like I sat through right? one of your classes. I don't, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if I can be very short on my remarks. Uh, I don't even really know where to begin. I was you, you, you covered a very broad uh, swath of information. Uh, let me let me just start. Uh, or within your field of of you know expertise, being a, a a professor, is are the opinions that you espouse with regard to your interpretation of history and the Constitution and other uh, other aspects. Uh, is that a uniform? Uh, is that something that's uniform amongst all professors, amongst all uh, people, with regard to the problems that you you present with uh, Article Five? It's 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 the gold standard, or are there varying different varying opinions? Well, 
one is inclined always to say that one's own opinion is the gold standard. Uh, but uh, no, I wouldn't say that my opinions are uh, a matter of unanimous uh, judgment. You've just heard uh, Mr. Farris, who's uh, written on this matter as well, who's written on the uh, Constitutional Convention under Article 5, and he disagrees. And I've read his work. Uh, I disagree with the conclusions that he has. For example, with respect to whether that original convention in Philadelphia uh, was uh, at the subject of, um, of the states or instead was called for by uh, the, the, the Continental Congress. And I, I, I think it's very clear if you look at the Congress's journals that irrespective of what the states had done before that, Congress put what the states did aside. Congress looked explicitly uh, at its power uh, or at the, the, the mechanisms for uh, amendment of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, it put aside the Annapolis Convention, and it passed the resolution of the state of New York, and that is a different resolution. Um, it, it, it is consistent with what the states had called for, but it's a different resolution right. from, um, from, uh, and, from and, what the and, states had and called my, for. And my... Uh perspective isn't one of the 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 weeds right that that we've obviously gotten into and some of my colleagues brought concerns about some of the weeds it's more the essence of why our founding fathers in their brilliance when constructing the con constitution an imperfect document okay from the standpoint that uh, there were not protections and freedoms for all uh, at the original uh, uh, document, but they created a process where the document could be amended to where and where the imperfections that existed and the limitations because of the political uh, constraints at the time could be changed uh, over time. And so Article 5 is obviously one of those uh, brilliant provisions uh, in, in, the, in the Constitution. The, the last the last amendment to be ratified was the 27th amendment is that correct 27th that's correct how long did that one take to get ratified about 200 years about 200 years right now and and, and i looked at it and i had staff uh, do some research for me uh I, the the amendment it, you would think it'd be extremely simple amendment to pass it, it's basically you can correct me if i'm wrong it says that if you pass a legislature, you know, if Congress passes uh, legislation with regard to uh, pay for Congress, that it can only go into effect the next term. Is that correct? Correct. 200 years to pass something that we, I believe most of us would feel is pretty low-hanging fruit. Yes. Okay. Um, obviously, that's the outlier of the, of the amendments right there, but uh, just wanted to point that one out. Uh, what do you feel the likelihood is that Congress will pass a, a balanced budget amendment? I would prefer not to speculate on that. I think I, my odds I of would, winning the Powerball are better. I, okay. I, I, would, I would simply point out that uh, since Richard Nixon's presidency, we've had a number uh, of mechanisms that Congress has put into place uh, in order uh, to to move us forward to a balanced budget. Since when? Since Richard Nixon's presidency. Since Nixon. We've been working since Nixon. Well, at that pace, okay, we'll, we'll have spent ourselves into oblivion, okay, by the time we actually get some progress. Uh, it's a, is it a two-thirds vote for Congress to pass a constitutional amendment that would have to go to, for ratification? Yeah, we need a two-thirds majority in each House of Congress, and we need a three-quarters uh, majority among uh, the states. Yeah, that, 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 I would almost call that almost impossible. It's just short of impossible, in my opinion. Um, you, we don't even need to talk about term limits. If you pass a balanced budget amendment, guess what? We'll have over half of Congress quit, okay? <laughs> because I'm going to tell you, in Louisiana— Maybe you can run. Yeah, uh, no, thank you. Uh, in Louisiana, when we're dealing with, you know, 1.5 to $2 billion deficits, tiny amounts, they lose that in the mattress cushion uh, uh, in, in Congress. Uh, we give more than that away to, uh, you know, other countries. And we're trying to make those cuts, and they have tremendous impacts on each one of our constituents. We all take that very seriously. Congress doesn't even have to worry about it. They're spending ourselves into oblivion. Do you know what? Do you know what the word mortgage, where it originates from, and what it means? 
Uh, I believe I do. Okay. Uh, I believe it comes from a French term. That's correct. Uh, having to do, well, having to do with debt and secured debt. Uh, but more than that, I, I would leave it to you to inform us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, it means death pledge. Death pledge, not debt, death. All right. We are mortgaging our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren's future. Have you looked at the debt clock lately? No, Representative Ivy, I haven't. Okay. You know, people, and I find it comical, you know, in a, in a terrible way, uh, people refer to the national debt as being such a tremendous problem at $19 trillion now. And that's almost laughable because that's only the, that's only the, uh, that's only one aspect of our debt. The, the total debt is $64 trillion, and then the unfunded liabilities is over $102 trillion, right? That $102 trillion of unfunded liabilities equates to approximately $853,000 per taxpayer. Right. And uh, in 2020, it's estimated that that'll be an additional uh, 20 trillion dollars added to that total debt there or you know, unfunded liability. And that's an additional three hundred ninety four thousand dollars per taxpayer by 2020. We're out of control. I, I personally, I find it difficult to even concede that we can recover from these kind of numbers personally. But, you know, I'm, I guess uh, I'll try to be a hopeful uh, optimist and think that if we if we take the drastic measures necessary to get our spending under control, we can actually turn things around because there's no one in their personal finances, their business finances or state finances who have spent themselves into oblivion, who, who can recover. You look, we, we're starting to see cities in our in our country uh, go bankrupt, you know, and um, the only reason that that Congress uh, it, we're not there nationally is because we can print as much money as we care to print. But there's always a day of reckoning, and it's always going to come. And what upsets me is that knowing Congress will never, and, and look, I, I tell you, I, I put any amount of money on Congress will never act to, to, to put themselves in check. They'll never do it. And our founding fathers gave us as states you know, you know where those federal dollars that you talk about come from? They come from taxpayers' pockets all around the country, including Louisiana. And personally, the, the fact that it may not be beneficial for Louisiana because of how much federal dollars we get, you know what? If the feds wouldn't take all our money to begin with, maybe we wouldn't have to beg for some of it back. Representative Ivey. Well, okay. can I Representative Ivey, the, the wisdom or not of having a balanced budget is beyond the subject of my presentation. Now, I will state as a personal matter that I believe in fiscal responsibility. Uh, having said that, uh, what is the subject of my presentation is about is the dangers that are presented in using this particular mechanism in order to achieve what some would argue and what many would agree are reasonable goals. Okay, well then what's the other mechanism we can use? And to that, of that course, goal. is the other, uh, that, well, first off, with respect to a balanced budget, uh, there is always the possibility of demanding of our representatives that they act responsibly. <laughs> At, and, and, and how does and, that work? And well, w one would think that the framers thought that it works well. And as a matter of democratic theory, one would think that it works well. And one would think that if the people actually presented a demand to their representatives and were forceful about it, they could force such a change. That's method number one. Method number two, of course, is under Article 5 and that is to impose a constitutional change, uh, not via a constitutional convention, but via, via the much more refined mechanism with uh, Congress passing resolutions and with states um, uh, confirming them. And we've done that 
27 times, and we have certainly done it in the past when we have had critical situations uh, in front of us. That was certainly the case with the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And if we really believe, and, and many of us do, that we have a critical situation with our budget. Can you remind me real quick the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment? The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are the Civil War Amendments that ended slavery, that imposed equal protection and due process of law as a national standard, and that um, uh, forbade racial discrimination with respect to the law. And, and what did those amendments take? A war. That yes, took a war. Did. Okay, that didn't come about because a bunch of politicians in Washington thought, you know, maybe we should settle this uh, because we feel it's best for the country. No. It was a bunch of stiff-necked politicians doing what they felt was in their best interest. Careful. Yeah, well, hey, I call it like I see it. <laughs> well, it, and, and that's true, it's Mr. Ivey, <laughs> but on the other end of the spectrum is the 18-year-old vote amendment. Uh, the number of that amendment escapes me. Uh, but that became law, as I recall, someplace around the period of a year uh, that we became um, convinced of the propriety of um, of allowing 18 year olds who could get drafted and who could get do who could uh, get killed in war the propriety of allowing them to vote and that that was at the, the other end of the spectrum. All right. Well, but, and, and I'm gonna sum it up right here. Thank you please, uh, for your uh, patience, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I haven't read all the Federalist Papers, and I've done a little bit of research on uh, several amendments, uh, particularly the Second Amendment and and, and, the, and the intent of our founding fathers. And I can tell you almost unanimously. To contrary to your your uh, position or presentation, our founding fathers, the Constitution, what the you know, obviously amendments one through ten were to put the limitations on the federal government. The federal government is is for the people. It's not for the sake of the federal government. The state, every right, not every power, not expressed in the Constitution is given up for the states to decide. Right. And our federal government, the judicial branch, the legislative branch and the executive branch have run amok uh, with that. That's why a state can uh, pass uh, a prohibition on gay marriage. And I'm not here to argue for or against it, but it's a state's rights issue. And if one state wants it, God bless them. If another one doesn't, guess what? It's their prerogative. And at, we've had judicial legislation at the uh, active from the bench tell us you know what no that's some right that is clearly not enumerated in the constitution so uh there's checks and balances and the states calling for a convention demanding in a, a convention is one of those checks and at the proper time i move favorable thank you representative uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen please hold your applause with this we'd like to keep this meeting in order uh, Representative Jenkins. All right. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You can certainly feel the passion uh, behind, behind a subject matter like this, and I think it's very passionate from every angle. But I, I, I want to try to come back to what I think the point of, of this thing is all about, the, uh, and that is can you limit or uh, what is the risk uh, involved with trying to limit a convention of states to one narrow subject? One of the subjects that's floated around here is the subject of a balanced budget. Uh, how, how can that, if it was just that one thing that, that was trying to be accomplished, how can that lead to uh, other subjects coming into uh, the convention? Well, Representative Jenkins, in my view, a convention which is called has the freedom to go beyond a narrow or limited call. So, so your view is that you cannot, the reality of trying to limit the convention to one specific call is, is something that is not achievable. You're ba basically, once you get into it, other subject matters can come in. But from a political perspective, Representative, Rep Representative Jenkins, perhaps uh, the, the, the convention will be self-limiting, that it will exercise discipline. Uh, from a constitutional 
um, um, from a constitutional, uh, I, I think that there is no constitutional limit on a convention which has the discretion, quote, to propose amendments. Okay. Those amendments, in my view, um, are the matter of are a matter of discretion equal to that that the House has, House of Representatives has, uh, in determining what an impeachable offense is, for example, or that the Senate has uh, in determining what its rules will be. Uh, I think when the Constitution gives discretion to a constitutional body, and we've seen this in many, many cases over time, uh, particularly with um, uh, the question of so-called political questions, uh, presidential power and uh, legislative power, um, that is not addressable uh, by the courts such that that discretion, uh, so long as a constitutional actor is acting within discretion given to it by the Constitution, that is not reviewable. Um, since, uh, again, if you look at this logically, uh, if we were to say that 34 states could limit the discretion of the convention. What this means is that 34 states limit the discretion of the entire nation in convention. And, and that is not logical either. So in my view, the only controls on the convention are the political discretion uh, that the convention is willing to exercise. And then uh, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, the, the judicial powers, uh, amendments that are made to the Constitution to become the law of the, uh, law of the nation. In other words, if you have Supreme Court rulings out there, there, there are amendments that could come and legislatively overrule some of those uh, decisions. Yes, sir, and that has been done in the past. Okay. And our federal government, I mean, if you go through the process, you have amendments, those are going to be amendments that are going to be there for the entire country, not one state having one rule and another state having a different rule. Yes. Is this a recent copy of the Constitution you passed out to us? Yes, that copy of the Constitution is uh, up to date. And uh, it, I, I just found it interesting, Article 13, that prohibits slavery and involuntary servitude, that amendment was rejected and never ratified by the state of Mississippi. It's true. So uh, we, we, we do know we need some uniformity throughout our country uh, to make uh, certain things uh, legal or prohibited uh, for every state and not just based upon one state saying I'm all right with another state saying I'm not. And that's an example just out of the text of this Constitution that I see. All right. yes, Thank sir. you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your answers to the questions. The board is clear. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chairman. We do have a late card in support. Uh, does not wish to speak. Robert Trahan himself in the Convention of States. And we have some cards in opposition. Jan Moeller with the Louisiana Budget Project is present and will provide information. And uh, in opposition, uh, does not wish to speak. Daniel Hayes, the Libertarian Party. Board is clear. Would you like to close on your bill? Members, Mr. Chairman, I apologize for taking so long with this issue. We really didn't think it would take that long. I appreciate the committee's time. And in deference to the committee, I won't try to refute all of the statements that Professor Diamond said, said although I could. Um, I just I want you guys to know that the one issue he didn't address was the ratification process. And even if you assume, which is crazy, that everything he said is true, we still have the ratification process, whereby three quarters of the states have to ratify any proposed amendments that would come out of this convention of states. And, and that, to me, is the ultimate stopgap measure. So please consider that. Make sure you understand what we're doing here. And, and please vote favorably on this measure. Thank you. OK. We have a motion by Representative Ivey uh, to move favorable on SCR 15. Is there any objection? which Representative Carter objects. 52. Uh, excuse me, 52. I'm once again on the wrong one. ACR 52. Um, we do have a motion by Representative Ivan, an objection by Representative Carter. Madam Secretary, roll call, please. Mr. Carter. Yes. Votes no. Mr. Jimmy Harris. Mr. Lance Harris. 
Yes. Votes yes. Ms. Hill? No. Votes no. Mr. Ivey? Yes. Votes yes. Mr. Jenkins? No. Votes no. Mr. Miller? Yes. Votes yes. Mr. Morris? Yes. Votes yes. Mr. Pugh? Yes. Votes yes. Mr. Schroeder? Mr. Shadowin? Yes. Votes yes. Mr. Chairman Danahay? No. Votes no. Six to four, that motion carries. Thank you, members. Thank you. Thank you, please, once again. Thank you for your time. Yes. Representative Carter on personal privilege. Oh. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before everyone leaves, I do want to, uh, there were some questions earlier about uh, Professor Ray Diamond and whether or not his, his views are, are mainstream or accepted or not. I do want to point out that I think he's one of our, our greatest academic assets in the state of Louisiana. Uh, he has his undergraduate degree from Yale, his law degree from Yale, he's a professor at LSU and he's widely published including in Yale Law Review. So, And he was my professor at Tulane Law School and so we certainly appreciate his effort on this subject and we, we certainly want to acknowledge him. 